Father God, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace to us. And Father, we know that even now, this does not take the place. This is not a, a substitute, if you will, for the coming together weekly and seeing each other and truly showing love and affection and, and, and socializing and encouraging and praising you and worshiping you. But Father, we believe that this is a means that your spirit has moved in our hearts to grab hold of today to use this. And Father, we believe that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, you send a special awareness of your presence that Jesus is with us even now. And so, Father, we lift up to you our world. We lift up places all around this world from China to South Korea to Italy to thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Exponentially, Father, we've seen it go from 300 to a few thousand to 10,000 people being affected in just a matter of a week or two weeks, God. And we're praying right now in the name of Jesus that your spirit would come over this world and that your spirit would arrest this virus. And Father, we pray that your spirit would arrest our hearts and the heart of the church and that during this time we would demonstrate and show you haven't given us a spirit of fear but of peace, love, and a sound mind. Let us be a light into this world. Might we give answers that point to you, Father, and might people find their hope in you through this very difficult time. So, Father, we pray for our world. We pray for our government leaders. We pray for our local leaders, Father, our state leaders. We thank you, God, for godly leadership. And Father, we know too that you use all forms of leadership even when they don't know that you're using them. So Father, we pray for all of our leaders today. We pray for the body of Christ. We pray for people at home. We pray for our family who's gathered around us even now. And Father, we pray for the church who's meeting all over the world today. Some are meeting together. Some are uh, doing online virtual worship events. Father, wherever the name of Jesus and the gospel is proclaimed, we trust that your word will not return void or empty, but it will accomplish great things. So Father, use this time. Draw us in. Might we give you our undivided attention in our hearts. And Father, before we go into worship, we also pray for the missionaries all around this world, God. We pray, Father, that you would encourage them. I pray, Father, for young men and young women and families all throughout this world. I told a young man yesterday, Father, you know, I said, I will pray for you. A ministry in Malawi, Father, I lift up to you even now. And wherever missionaries are today, God, encourage them, protect them. Might your word go forth through their lives. And might your word go forth through our time here. We wouldn't want to do it without you, Father. We wouldn't even want to begin. So we trust in your power now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Sing with us this morning. When darkness tries to roll over my bones Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own Brokenness and pain is all I know. I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. too high and I am not a captive to the lies 
I'm not afraid to leave my past behind And I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken But my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love You see, there's power there Oh, there's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save Power in your name Power in your name There's power Oh, there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. Power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
never stop, never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Give me vision to see things like you do. And God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what to do.
church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Over our families. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Over our health. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Over this nation. Forever all my days. Hallelujah. Let's sing hallelujah. with us over your families, over your homes, over our nation right now. Church. Sickness, you 
know, this past Friday morning, I had a great, great opportunity to be at Callaway County High School. Uh, shout out to any of our uh, students from Callaway County who might be watching today. I uh, had a great opportunity to be with them Friday morning and, and kind of relay um, what Thursday felt like to me and the unique perspective that I had on Thursday. And, you know, and Thursday was just one of those very, very bizarre, strange days. You know, uh, when you think about everything that took place, and I think my memory is serving me correct, Brother Steve, uh, that was the night we got together for the, that last ball game, right? Yeah, and so, you know, you first find out about the state tournament uh, and, and what happened there, and we're just so sorry for, you know, the girls of Marshall County, and unfortunately they weren't able to play that game. But we found out that that game was canceled. It was just like a shot in the heart. Uh, and then you go to the SEC tournament, and that was canceled. And then you find out that March Madness is canceled. Uh, then you find out the Players' Championship of, of the PGA Tour and what was going on that, this weekend was there. And all this was happening. And, you know, it just kind of had the feeling. It just had the feeling that, uh, like Chicken Little, like the sky was falling. And all these things were coming down. And I shared with those students on Friday I said, you know, when everything begins to fall apart and everything's coming down, you know, it really uh, puts life in perspective. I said, you know, for a sports fan, guys, it's just a tad hot in here. I said, for, uh, that's the, the volume here. I said, guys, uh, for a sports fan on Thursday, that was like a, a sportsman's purgatory. You know what I'm saying? For everything to go away, it's like a sportsman's purgatory. Like waking up in a, in a nightmare, in a bad dream. But then it's almost like a nerd's utopia. It's a nerd's paradise because there's no sports and there's no social interaction. So, you know, you you have those two perspectives taking place, you know. But when the house seems like it's fallen and everything seems to crumble around you, what do you have? I hope you have a foundation, a faith foundation. And it's during times like this that we realize what's really important, what really matters. And your faith foundation, when it's strong and it's solid, it substantiates. It gives meaning to everything else around it. But even when everything else around it, the roof, the walls, the subfloor, When all that collapses, even though your faith foundation substantiates all of that, if you have a faith foundation, then you have the most important thing that you need. And you can rebuild a house for the glory of God. So we trust that that's what's going to happen, that God's going to rebuild lives. He's going to rebuild homes. Hopefully he'll rebuild our world and our culture. And it'll be a a house and a structure that honors and glorifies him because a firm foundation was laid first. Well, today we're going to continue in our teaching series that we've entitled One Another. And my goodness, what an incredible opportunity we have this week and even now in the weeks to come to one another, one another. And what we've been learning in this series that we've entitled One Another is that in Scripture, there's over 50, there's over 50 one another statements. That these one another statements speak of like serving one another, encouraging one another, building one another up, forgiving one another, carrying the burdens of one another, submitting to one another, caring for one another, one another, one another, one another. And what we've been discovering is that when you one another, one another, and we call that one anothering, it's like a boomerang effect. As you seek the fulfillment and the happiness of others, God has a way of sending it back to you. That when you selflessly one another, one another, and do what you do for what others get out of it, it comes 
back to you. And it gives you a fulfilled, joyous, and happy life. Because in Christ, this is what you're made for. You're made to resemble His heart. And God's heart is to give love away. And it comes back to you in a way that only God can cause it to come back to you in your life. Well, of all the one another things that we could do, one of the greatest things that we can do is to pray for one another. Last week in the first part of this message, we were in the book of James. And there we heard the words of James, and James said, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And then he said this, the effective, the energized, laser-focused, pointed, targeted, fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman can accomplish much. And then James gave an example. And the example that he gave was the example of Elijah. And Elijah was a man who acted on the Word of God and then in his prayer life, in his prayer life, the Scripture says that he prayed for the heavens to shut off the rain. And when he prayed, the heavens shut off the rain. But then, at the Word of the Lord, when he prayed again, the heavens opened up. And the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. Elijah, listen to me. Elijah, when he prayed the first time, he shut the heavens from rain. But when he prayed again, God used that prayer to open the heavens back up. Now we come to Mark chapter 2. Perhaps this is a picture, a physical example of the spiritual principle of prayer. We find this in Mark chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. And bear with me. This is just a little bit of a lengthy text. I hope you can find it in your Bible right now, Mark chapter 2. And let me just say also, in this time of gathering online, we have prayer counselors standing by right now. People who will pray for you. Uh, there's a telephone number uh, that is being, I think, put on the screen or has been put on the screen 270-527-7615. If anyone here, anyone in our online worship gathering, if any one of you, if you need to talk to somebody today and you need to pray, uh, have somebody pray for you, then, then dial 270-527-7615. We have prayer counselors who are on standby right now. Now, if you call and, uh, and you don't get an immediate answer, Please go ahead and call back, uh, and, and somebody will get to you uh, as soon as they can. Uh, so please, if you need somebody personally praying with you over the phone today, uh, call that number, 270-527-7615. Let's read this text together. This is Jesus. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at a home. He was at a gathering in a home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, a, a, a man who was paralyzed, carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when he had, when they had dug an opening, when they had dug an opening, perhaps in the ancient world, there might have been tiles or pallets on the roof or thatch or, or mud that, you know, uh, insulated the home. They had to literally dig into the house. Fervent, concentrated, laser beamed, targeted, digging. When they dug an opening, they let down the pallet in which the paralytic was lying. 
And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, Jesus said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately uh, picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, Whew. After all of this, and after Jesus did that which only Jesus can do, they said, We have never seen anything like this. Father, in this moment, we trust your power. We trust your spirit. And Father, we trust that your spirit and your power is going uh, from our hearts and from here to every home and every life that is watching right now. Father, we trust that your spirit is moving over this world as your people are asking you to heal the land, to grant wisdom, encouragement, peace, to turn hearts to you, God, during this time. Father, even now as we share these words, help us how to, help us, Father, to have a better understanding of what's really happening when we one another, one another, in prayer. Teach us what's happening, what it really means, God, to pray for one another. And we pray that Jesus would be exalted. He would be felt. He would be known in this time. He's the living word. And we trust you, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. And amen. Wow. Well, like we've said the last several weeks, we've been talking about uh, what it means to one another, to really do what we do for what other people get out of this and to uh, serve and to pray. Uh, today we're talking about praying, but to serve, uh, to encourage, to build up, to, to put up with one another, all of those things that we've been talking about, accepting one another. Uh, today we're, we're talking about praying for one another as James encourages us to confess our sins and, and to pray for one another. And then on the heels of that, you know, he says, you know, the the prayer of a righteous person. Your prayers today can accomplish much. The prayers, a, a man, Elijah was a man, the scripture says, with a nature like ours, meaning that, that he's no different than you and he's no different than me. He's not anybody special. He's just a person who had a heart for God and he prayed. And great things can happen when people do that. Well, there's a great example, we think, here in the Gospel of Mark of maybe what is a physical example of the spiritual principle of prayer. And I want to identify what I think are three keys to effective prayer. And I think you see these three keys in this biblical text today. And we'll talk about the text in just a second. But I think that the first key that we see here, uh, it, it has to do with willing and faithful prayers. <laughs> now, just like last week, we, we talked about, you know, confessing your sins to one another. That doesn't mean you confess to everybody. It simply means that when you do that, then you're going to trust people who are going to pray for you. So, so you're confessing your sins to prayers, people who are not going to talk about you and share your stuff in the community, but people who are really going to pray for you. 
one of the first keys to effective prayers, to effective praying, is willing and faithful prayers, people who pray. The other thing I think you're going to see in this text today, and this is where a lot of people really struggle, I think, when it comes to praying for other people and not seeing change or the results that they would like to see perhaps taking place in someone's life. It is a a willing and faithful prayer object. Not just willing and faithful prayers, people praying, but a willing and faithful prayer object. I think we're going to see that in the text. And then here's the third part of this. That is perhaps the most important of all of it, but it's like a puzzle piece. All these come together, and perhaps, perhaps this is the foundation of effective prayers. It is a willing and a faithful Savior. A willing and a faithful Savior. So let's talk about the first part of this. So we know that Jesus was in a home, and he was gathering with people, and the Scripture says that he was just sharing the Word. Uh, looked at this last night, not really for sure exactly what all that means or exactly what all he was sharing. He was just sharing the word, uh, speaking the truth of God, uh, perhaps encouraging people, perhaps even challenging people, teaching people. He's in the home and, and, and he's doing this. And then you have a situation that is taking place outside the home. And there is a, a, a paralytic, a man who is paralyzed, and we don't know his history. We don't know much about this individual. We just know that he was paralyzed. And he had four friends. I believe that's what the text says. There were four friends who were with him. And maybe it went something like this. Maybe this paralytic was like, you know, uh, there's Jesus in this home. And my only hope is in Jesus. But I can't get to him. I mean, when when you think, listen to this. When you think about the obstacles in this man's life, his physical obstacle, first and foremost, of not being able to get into the presence of Jesus was what was going on with his body. He was a paralytic. He was paralyzed. He was uh, completely dependent upon other people. He could not physically carry himself into the home, even if there wasn't a crowd. So you're talking about barriers and obstacles to getting to Christ. This man had a very real, real barrier and obstacle. Not even thinking about the crowd of people that was there. And then how uh, he would get there, even depending upon his friends. But he had four friends who loved him and cared about him. And so apparently the conversation went like this. was like, hey guys, I, I think my hope is there in Jesus. He, maybe he can touch me and heal me. We don't know exactly what all was going on in his heart and his mind to get to Jesus. But the scripture tells us that he had four friends. And they were willing. They were willing to say, yeah, we will take you to Jesus. Maybe the friends went to him. And maybe they said to him, hey, listen, Jesus is in town. And Jesus can change your life. Why don't you let us take you to Jesus? Don't know for sure how that conversation went. The scripture just tells us that the paralytic was taken by his four friends to try to see Jesus. However, because of the crowd... They could not get to Jesus. So, so imagine this scene. Imagine this now. The four friends take the paralytic man. They crawl up on top of this house. Perhaps they, car- they, they had to have. They carried him on top of the house. Maybe pulled him up by a rope. Maybe two uh, picked him up. The other, We don't know. But they get on top of the house. And then they have to get into the room. Willing and faithful friends who were willing to overcome all the obstacles in order to get their friend 
to Christ. Is this not a picture of prayer? That there is a paralyzed friend, a friend who's hurting in need, a paralyzed situation, a difficult time, and you have willing and faithful prayers who take the situation and they carry the situation through all, all the obstacles and all the challenges to the one who can make the difference. Willing and faithful prayers carrying difficult situations to people, to Christ. Difficult situations of people to Christ. They're one anothering. The paralytic. Now the text doesn't tell us what the friends get out of this. Uh, they're going to get a lot out of it by seeing the miracle that's performed and by being in the presence of Jesus. But you might be interested to know that actually prayers and praying being a spiritual person who prays and prays for yourself and prays for others, there's a great benefit that comes to you. Uh, in his book, How Happiness Happens, Max Lucado tells about the findings of Dr. Harold Koenig of Duke University. Dr. Koenig co concluded, based on an exhaustive analysis of more than 1,500 reputable medical studies that people, listen to this, that people who are spiritual and people who pray, people who are more spiritual and pray more have better mental and physical health. He went on to say that spiritual people, who those who pursue divine assistance, they cope with stress better, they, they experience greater well-being because they have more hope. They are more optimistic. Listen to this. They experience less depression. They have less anxiety. And people who are spiritual and pray commit suicide less often. Locato said, The act of praying for others has a boomerang effect. It allows us to shift the burden we carry for others to the shoulders of God. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is reaching up to heaven to bring heaven to earth. It is identifying and recognizing a situation on earth and realizing that God is the only one who can give hope in that situation. Prayer touches heaven and it brings heavenly solutions to earthly problems and challenges. Prayer is is the conduit by which the two come together. It allows us to shift the burden we carry for others to the shoulders of God. He invites us to cast all our cares upon Him. Impossible burdens are made bearable because we pray about them. He said, don't fret about politicians, pray for them. Don't grow angry at the conditions of the church, pray for her. And don't let the difficulties of life suck you under. Give them to God before they get to you. Four friends who are willing and faithful to carry a man to Christ. And their efforts, as James says about the effective prayer of a righteous man, their efforts were determined, their efforts were focused, their efforts were energized, their efforts were laser beamed, targeted. They were determined in their efforts to get the man to Christ. I can't imagine what it must have been like being in that room. To be in that room and to see all of a sudden like the sky open up. And the sky opens up, light begins to come in, and then all the people in that room are watching. And then the next thing you know is you see a man being lowered down. 
Can you imagine looking up into the bright light that, that the whole has now created? And you see the shadow of this figure being lowered down. And he's on a pallet. And the pallet hits the floor in that house. Getting everyone's attention. Namely, the attention of Jesus. And from what we know in the text, the first, the first words out of the mouth of Christ. Jesus says to them. Seeing their faith. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But I want you to pay attention here for just a second to what Jesus saw. He saw their faith. This is a third person plural pronoun. Their faith. You got a couple of options as to how you in, would interpret their faith. When you think about their faith, you could say that it was the faith of the paralytic's friends only. Jesus saw the faith of the friends. You could also say, that it was the faith of the paralytic, because plural means more than one. You could say the faith, it was the faith of the paralytic and at least one of his friends. Jesus saw their faith. So are you following? It could be the faith of the paralytic friends only, Jesus saw their faith, or it could be that Jesus saw the faith of the paralytic and at least one friend, Jesus saw their faith. It could also mean that Jesus saw the faith of them all. He saw all of their faith. But the one thing that we know absolutely for certain. Is that it wasn't just the faith of the paralytic only. It was certainly the faith of his friends. Jesus saw the willing and faithful friends. And there is no reason in the text, and there is no reason on earth to even begin to imagine that the paralytic didn't have faith too, because he had faith to let his friends carry him on top of a roof. He had faith to let his friends dig into a house. He had faith. To allow his friends to say, hey, we're going to put you on a pallet. <laughs> we're going to put you on a pallet and we're going to lower you down. He had faith to let his friends lower him down. He had faith by their suggestion to get to Jesus. He is the picture of the second part of this. Not just Faithful and willing or willing and faithful prayers, but a faithful and willing prayer object. He had faith himself. I, I can remember several years ago, a good, good friend of mine was going through a difficult time and situation in her marriage. Her husband had been unfaithful. They had children together. Home was being divided and torn. She reached out to her friends and said, we need to pray for my husband. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. Time went on. They prayed, they prayed, they prayed. She prayed. Her friends prayed. But there was no turning of his heart. And she came back to her friends and came back to us and she was like, I have prayed and I prayed and I prayed. What, what's going on? Is God not hearing my prayers? And boy, I remember seeking wisdom and trying to seek uh, counsel from the Lord. 
And the only thing that I could give back to her in that moment of, of trying to give her answers was, I know you're willing in prayer, but is, your, but is your husband willing to hear? Is he willing to allow the Spirit of God to come into his life and to speak to him? Is he willing to, to, to allow God to influence his life and to shape him and to mold him? Mold him? Perhaps the reason that some of our prayers are not answered is because as we pray for people, people in situations must be willing for God to touch their life. They must be a, a willing and faithful prayer object. And I just want to ask you today, are you a faithful and willing prayer object? As other people want to pray for you and encourage you and lift you up, are you willing for God to touch your life? Are you willing and are you open to what God wants to do in you? And then the last thing you have, and we'll close with this. And there's so much more to be said about this. And, and maybe this will turn into a three-part message. <laughs> but you must have a, a willing and a faithful Savior. A willing and a faithful Savior. And Jesus said to the man, your sins are forgiven. And he was showing and demonstrating that he has the very power of God. These were divine words. Only God could grant forgiveness. And I want you to know and I want you to understand. Even in the Old Testament days when God might grant forgiveness. Say to David when he prayed and confessed and repented. Forgiveness always comes on the basis of the cross. Whether it's before the cross or after the cross, all forgiveness is made possible because of the cross of Jesus Christ. There in that moment, Jesus pronounces forgiveness to show that He is God. And He could touch this situation. And He could heal this man in a deeper level than just his physical problems. Because the physical problems, they're one thing. But the spiritual problem is another of, of a world and of a nation and of a community and of a school and of a church. Oh, might we, might we be broken more over the spiritual nature of things that are going on than we are broken over the physical things of a tournament being canceled or an event not being attended. Jesus speaks to the spiritual need of the man. But then, to show by deed who he is, and not just by word, he tells the man to get up and to walk. Jesus did both. He forgave and he healed. He touched the spiritual and he touched the physical. And He cares so much about our lives and about our world. He can do both, guys. He can do both. But notice He did the spiritual first. And then He did the physical. A willing and a faithful Savior was here. And next week when we come back together, we're going to look into the will of God in prayer. And we're going to look at two views of realities, two extreme views of reality. And we understand God does not answer every prayer. He doesn't. He has a conditional will. He has an unconditional will. And you and I, we live somewhere in the middle of that. And we don't always know what is His unconditional will of what He says, I'm going to do. And there is no, there's no hell. There's no high water that can stop it. And we don't always know His, that was His unconditional will. And we don't always know His conditional will of what He says, I would do this. I will do this. But I want human cooperation. This is predicated upon prayer. This is predicated upon the cooperation of people 
There are things that God would will to do, but He has conditioned it in such a way that you must pray. And we don't always know where those two to come together. We, we often live in the middle. We'll talk about this next week. But here's the conclusion. Here, here is the conclusion. You pray with all you've got. And either you're praying to Him because, as James said, you're sick and you're troubled, or you're praising Him because things are going okay. You're always talking to God. You're either praying Him or you're praising Him. And as you hear the words of Paul, Paul said, pray without ceasing. You pray with all you've got. And you do that for one another. And you trust God. Jesus with the results. That's where you find rest. That's where you find peace. But don't let things not be done because you did not pray. So let's do that now. Again, our prayer counselors are there, they're waiting uh, for calls. You can reach out to them. Please continue to text, encourage one another this week. Remember the prayer guide that we briefly mentioned, asking God for His mercy in our situation in this world, praying for our president, national leaders, local leaders. Pray that we'll be mindful that Scripture tells us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts, that we'll recognize who the true enemy is in all of this, and ask God to protect our missionaries and their families around the globe, using this global crisis to advance the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I have felt your presence. I have felt your prayers. I hope you have felt ours today. For you. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, and my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness. Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live Father, you've been with us this morning, and we know that you go with us even now. We thank you, Father, that you are where we are, whether that's here, it's at home, at work this week. Wherever our kids are this week, Father, you're there, and you're good, and you're sovereign, and we trust you, Lord. In Jesus, you've given us everything we could ever want, ever need, ever hope for. Remind us even now, Father, that all that's left for us to do is rest and trust in Jesus. We love you so much, Lord, and we trust you with this week. You're good. We worship you even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everybody.